Chapter number 10, going through verse by verse, uh, the book of Hebrews, were uh, dealt last week. We dealt last week with Hebrews chapter number 10, really the first part of it. Uh, we ended there specifically in uh, verse number 19. So we're going to begin in verse number 20 uh, here in just a moment. Just a brief review of uh, what we left off with and what the theme really of the first portion of Hebrews chapter number 10 was, verses 1 uh, through 19. I think we may have actually read uh, verse uh, 20 and 21. But I'm going to back up a little bit because it flows into what we're going to be talking about. That's really the bridge of uh, the latter portion of Hebrews 10. But the first chapter really deals with the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And if you keep in mind, one of the major themes of the book of Hebrews is how things are better under the New Covenant. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than, you know, men. He's better than mankind, right? He's better than Abraham, it talks about. He's better than Moses. He's, be he's a better high priest. He is better than, Mil it talks about him being Melchizedek, but he's better than the Levites, I'm sorry. His priesthood is better than the Levites. And then it also talks about his sacrifice, and here in the first portion of Hebrews chapter number 10, it compares his sacrifice to the sacrifice of the Old Testament. And the point is to show or to demonstrate his superiority, how his sacrifice was much greater yeah. than the sacrifices of the Old Testament. That's really what the first portion of Hebrews chapter number 10 is about, how his sacrifice was eternal, how there was only one, and how the sacrifices of the Old Testament, they had to repeat those because of their inferiority. So right here in Hebrews chapter number 10, as I said, we're going to begin in verse number 19 with the second portion. We kind of switch gears here. It says this, Having therefore, so this is a conclusion of what we had read, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And we ended on that note, speaking of him being the mediator, his flesh, him being the mediator between God and man. He's 100% God, he's 100% man. Verse number 21, And having an high priest over the house of God, referring to Jesus Christ. Verse 22 says this, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, right when we're getting ready to get into this, we've already kind of touched on the theme of the last portion of Hebrews chapter number 10. So I want to stop for just a minute, the last portion of Hebrews 10. And I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter number 6. Now, if you remember another theme uh, that has carried all throughout the book of Hebrews is this. And this is really the application to the reader. It's endurance. It's patience. We remember we define the word patience in the Bible uh, as enduring. In James chapter number 5, they're used interchangeably. You can actually demonstrate that in a few different passages in the Bible. So what he, when he's talking about them having patience, he wants them to endure. He's speaking to Christians, saved believers, and he's telling them that they need to move forward. They need to you know, keep their faith, strengthen their faith, keep your confidence, and move forward. Oftentimes, the, the, the Christians at this time were going through persecution. So they're, uh, uh, in context, being uh, prodded or provoked to endure or be patient through the persecution. Now, what we're going to read here in Hebrews chapter 10 is a very, very strong parallel with Hebrews chapter 6. And if you remember, Hebrews chapter 6 is a controversial passage because there's a lot of different interpretations. A lot of people that preach a false gospel, you know, Pentecostals and people that are very big on losing your salvation, which of course the Bible teaches eternal security, once saved, always saved. Amen. They try to go to Hebrews 6 and they try to abuse that passage to teach that you can lose your salvation. When Hebrews chapter number 6 is really just uh, uh, speaking and, and provoking the believer, the Christian, to endure. And that's what Hebrews 6 is about and that's what Hebrews 10 is about. So there in Hebrews 10, 22, it said this. One more time, I'll read it for you. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Then verse number 23, the very beginning. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. So notice this idea of, of keep your faith, strengthen your faith, be, be you know, uh, uh, we want you to have assurance, right? Don't waver. If you go back to Hebrews chapter number 6, I want you to look with me at first at verse number 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So we see the same word used there even. The conclusion of Hebrews chapter 6, look at verse number 18, says this, 
that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So, here at the end of Hebrews chapter number 6, he just got done talking about how God cannot lie and how not only can God not lie, he swore by an oath. He didn't need to because it's, he, his word is already faithful. He cannot lie. You know, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. God is not a man that he should lie, the Bible says in the book of Numbers. So he didn't even need to swear by an oath, but he did that, the Bible teaches right here, for us. So that we would have a strong consolation, so that we would have confidence and we could have you know, a full assurance. And so that we would endure and it, that he would be able to instill strength in our hearts even more so. Because he knows how man can be wavery. Uh, so, and then it goes on, it says, ninth, verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Speaking of Jesus, both sure and steadfast. So it's immovable. And which entereth into that within the veil. So notice the veil being mentioned again. Jesus going in within the veil. Now he's going in as our high priest. Also verse number 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the high priest is mentioned. The veil is mentioned. Assurance is mentioned. It should give us greater hope because of this. Well, right here, what's being used to encourage us or to give us a greater hope or you know, to give us a, 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 you know, a stronger heart in this sense is the fact that God cannot lie. So we can depend on Him because He's faithful. Well, in Hebrews 10, it's talking about how great a sacrifice Jesus gave. And because of how great a sacrifice that is, we should have boldness. Because of, you know, uh, uh, it says in verse 19 of Hebrews 10 again, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So in this sense, what should give us more boldness or what should give us more confidence is you know, uh, the greatness of and the strength of Jesus' blood. So he's using different examples here of what should give us assurance, what should give us a stronger hope, what should give us a stronger confidence. So I wanted to point out to you all of those parallels because we're going to see even more parallels with Hebrews 6 in just a moment. Notice also in verse 22, back in Hebrews 10 again, it says, "...having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure Water. So here this is obviously a reference back to the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews is, is uh, uh, very Old Testament-esque as far as in Scripture. It's quoting Scripture a lot. He's relating to you know, the, the Old Testament Scriptures and to the Jews and to their beliefs. And uh, right there he's obviously making a reference, an analogy. He's making an analogy uh, or a parallel between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was consummated through the sprinkling of the blood and of water specifically. So right now he's talking about our salvation and uh, he's, he's speaking about it as in it being an analogy of when we got saved, you know, he sprinkled our hearts, you know, with blood and with pure water, that He sanctified our souls. Obviously that sanctification came through the Holy Spirit and there was a literal sprinkling of blood on an altar in heaven, but He's speaking uh, by comparing it with the Old Testament consummation of uh, the covenant when He sprinkled the blood and water when Moses did that on the people and on the book and on the Ark of the Covenant. Verse number 23 says, let us hold fast, that's steadfast, just like we, we saw that word in verse Hebrews, in, uh, Hebrews 6. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. That also ties in with Hebrews 6. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That is a powerful verse, and that's an important verse. How important encouragement is. But I want to tie it in with verse number 25. It says this, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now verse number 24 and verse number 25 are a part of the same clause. Notice that there's a colon there, right? At the end of verse number 24, there's a colon, and your period does not uh, appear until the end of verse number 25. So this is a part of the same clause. And he starts off in verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And then 
He gives the famous verse, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, what does the word church mean? The word church means congregation or it means assembly. That's what the word church actually means. So when he says the assembling of ourselves together, he's referring to coming to church. He's referring to uh, the congregation. You know, these two words are used interchangeable. If you look up uh, verses, you know, from the Old Testament, you know, actually in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter number two, he quotes the book of Psalms. And he says, in the midst of the church, uh, you know, I will sing praise unto thee, or will I sing praise unto thee? Well, that's quoted from the book of Psalms. And in the book of Psalms, it says, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise unto thee. So notice how church is congregation. The same thing happens in the book of Acts. In Acts, I believe, 7. It quotes the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it uses the word assembly. In the Old Testament, it, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, it uses the word church again. That's a New Testament word. Then in the Old Testament, it uses the word assembly. So these three words are actually used interchangeable. They are equivalent to one another. Uh, they're synonymous, if you will. Church, congregation, assembly. This is a commandment to come to church. It is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's not a suggestion. This is not just Paul giving his opinion. He is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he is giving a commandment of what you are to do and how you are to live your life Amen. as a Christian. And a lot of people, when they don't come to church, do you know the reason why? Because they feel like they're not getting anything out of it. Because they feel like this isn't the right church for them. Because they feel like this church is just not good for them. And oftentimes if you ask people about why they're not going to church, they'll give you a reason from their own perspective of why they're not going to church. They'll tell you, well, I just feel like maybe I wasn't getting enough recognition. I wasn't getting enough opportunities. I wasn't getting this. I wasn't getting that. But is that the main reason why we should go to church? If you ask a pastor of, hey, give me the main verse in the Bible that commands me to go to church, what is it? He would tell you Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Most pastors were, would. I believe it's the, the one of the... Uh, I, would, I would give it to you. I would say I personally believe it's the clearest command to go to church. But what's the reason why? Look at verse 24 again. And let us consider one another. Notice that. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So what is the reason when Paul gives the actual commandment, the most clear commandment, the obvious commandment of going to church, don't forsake the assembly, don't forsake the congregation. What's the reason why he says it's so important to go? To consider one another. Right. You need to be thinking about other people. Amen. So whoever he's writing to should be thinking about other people in the church. If somebody here decides, it, it starts contemplating, hey, I don't feel like going to church tonight. I just want to stay home and, and you know, watch the game. Or I just want to stay home and watch a movie. Or I just want to stay home and do whatever. Work on a hobby or whatever you want to do. You know, you shouldn't think first, well, I would be missing out. You know what you should think? Well, I don't want some of my other brethren to be discouraged because I didn't come to church. Right. I don't want, let's say that it's Brother Hall that's thinking, hey, maybe I'm not going to go to church this Sunday. You know what he should stop and think? I don't want to discourage Brother Rick. I don't want to discourage the pastor. I don't want to discourage some of the other people in the church and maybe they stop going to church. Right. Everybody needs to get this idea out of their mind where it's all about them. Right. We need to start thinking about other people. We need to start thinking about our brethren and caring about our brethren. If we're ever going to have good unity, great unity, a, a strong unity in the church, it's going to be because you know, we're putting others first. Right. It's going to be because we're, we're actually thinking about other. You know, the Bible tells us, let each esteem other better than himself. This is a teaching all throughout the New Testament and especially in Paul's writings. We need to think about our brethren. We need to think about everybody else in the church, how you're affecting everybody else. Do you know what you should think of when you come to church? You need to think, I'm going to try to give other people some edification tonight. I'm going to try to sing loud so that I can edify others. I'm going to try to you know, make sure that I greet you know, whoever walks in and to be very hospitable to them. I'm going to, uh, you know, even if you're going, maybe going through a hard time, try to be in a good mood for other people. You can lift their spirits up. Amen. It's not just about you. It's not just about ourselves. We need to, you know, crucify ourselves. We need to put others first. We need to think about how we're affecting other people. There are many people that have fallen out of Christianity, fallen out of the faith, backslidden because others discouraged them and maybe they're backsliding. So, and they may have not, maybe they just gave up themselves because something personally happened. And they fell out of the fight. 
And because they did so, they caused maybe another person to fall out of the fight. People need to stop thinking. You know another thing you need to think about others? You need to think about, excuse me, your children. Right. That's what you need to think about. You need to think about your family. You need to think about your wife. Amen. Your wife, not wives, goodness sakes, Abraham with Hagar. And, no, I'm just kidding. You need to think about your wife, right? You need to think about your children. You need to think about how bad it is you know, to, to, to grow up in the United States of America today and not attending church. You know, how damaging it is to your children when they're not coming to church every Sunday. Do you know what you're doing? You are right now embedding into your children's mind. You are forming them and fashioning them in their habits and their routines of what they're going to do when they grow up. If you go to church, when your children grow up, they'll go to church. If you set church as a priority in your life, your children will have it as a priority in their life when they grow up. If you, you know, uh, uh, take church seriously, if you go soul winning, your children will go soul winning. If you read your Bible every day, your children will read your Bible every day. You need to think about other people. You know why husbands need to be good leaders and, and set a good example? Not just for themselves. You don't just think about, hey, I'm getting rewards in heaven. Think about your wife. Think about your children. They're watching you and what you do, that's what they're going to do. You are fashioning and forming your children of who they're going to be. And I, I, you know, I would dread the idea that my children grew up and forsook church. Obviously, they make their own decisions and, and here and there maybe something like that may happen. But I would dread the idea more so to know that it was my fault and to know that maybe I went to church once every other month or I went to church you know, once a month or I went to church maybe once every four months and then when my children grow up, they just completely forsake church. They go once a year. They go once every other year. Church needs to be a priority in our lives. Church needs to be a priority. The Bible says that Christ gave himself for the church. The Bible says that he purchased it with his own blood. I mean, that's pretty important. The Bible says that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is extremely important. You know, to, to the church, the Bible says that he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, without the church, you can't be perfect. You can't be complete. You're always going to be lacking if you don't have the church. If you don't have the congregation, iron sharpeneth iron. We have to have, you know, the fellowship. We have to have the brethren. Church is important. The Bible says, blessed is the man who is planted in the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, we have to have the church. We shouldn't be questioning how many times should we come to church. We should be looking for opportunities to go to church as often as we possibly can. If your heart's right, you just want to be at church. You want to be around the brethren. I love, you know, when I walk in, you know, Wednesday, you know, especially even more so this week because I've been moving, you know, around and, and, I, and I'm spending even more time in the world, if you will, less time with my family uh, because I'm having to work more hours right now. I just can't wait when, I'm, when, it's, when it feels like it's been a long time since I've been about, around brethren, about like-minded, you know, other brothers. I love to see your face. I love to shake your hand. It puts me in a good mood. I get sick of the world. I'm ready to see some brethren. I'm ready to see and walk into the house of the Lord and, and sing some songs. I love to when we start singing the hymns. just puts me in a good mood instantly. Amen. You know, I love church. And I, want, I would come to church as often as I could. And that's the, the we shouldn't be, you know, looking, you know, in, in, in the Bible to say, well, how many times does God actually want me to read through my Bible? Do you know what, you know what you're doing in your heart? You're trying to do the minimum. That's what you're, how many times does he want me to do, to read my Bible? You know, so I could just make sure that I do that. How many, you know, the Bible doesn't really have a commandment on how many times I have to go to church. You know what you're trying to do? Limit the amount of times you go to church. That means your heart's not right. You should love church. You should love reading your Bible. You should love these things. You should not get enough of them. Right. As often as you can, obviously. The, you know, the church is extremely important. So this is a great commandment. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That's embarrassing right there. You notice what he said? He's thinking of specific people. As the manner of some is. Some people do this. You know what they do? They don't come. Paul's thinking of certain people when the assembly came together. He knew people. He knew groups of people that just didn't show up sometimes. Everybody gathered together, so-and-so, so-and-so's house, so-and-so's family, they didn't come. They don't come very often. They come when they can. They come when they want to, right? You know, can, quote-unquote. But notice again, why? But exhorting one another. You should come to church for other people. You shouldn't think about what the church can do for you. 
You should think about what you can do for the church. But exhorting one another, watch this, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Is the day near, more near today than at Paul's time, or was it more near at Paul's time? Obviously today, right? So if Paul was exhorting them to go to church at, 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 in, in his era, in his time period, when he was alive, and he said to do it even more so as you see the day approaching, is Paul exhorting them at, that were currents that were contemporaries with him at that time to go to church more or us? Think about that. Us. This means even more so to us. We should be even doing it more. Uh, we should uh, have, any opportunity that we have, we should be coming to church as you see the day approaching. Now I want you to look at verse 26 as well. For. What does that mean? It means because. So are we starting a completely different thought? It's a conjunction. For means because. Because if we sin willfully. Now I want you to notice that. What did it start talking about if you don't go to church? For, if we sin willfully. Do you know what people, you know when you're coming to church, it keeps your conscience clean here in the Word of God. It, it, you, you see other brethren striving to try to live their lives accordingly to God's Word. You hear the preaching of God's Word. It's getting into your minds. You know what it does? It convicts your heart. And it at least keeps you attempting and trying to live. Obviously, we're all sinners are going to continue to sin. We should keep purging these sins out. And it's not okay, but we're never going to become where you're perfectly sinless. But if you're coming to church, it's going to continually, uh, uh, you know, instill in you the desire to live a clean life. But when you get totally away from that, you know what you start doing? You start just searing your conscience. It's, it gets easier to put up with it. When you're not around things that are holy and sanctified in the Word of God, it gets easier to commit sin. It gets easier day by day when you're not hearing the Word of God, you're not hearing warnings. It gets easier to commit sin. Notice what he's talking about. For if we sin willfully... So you know what's going to take place more often when you're not uh, uh, um, attending church? You're going to sin more often, but it's just going to be more willful sins. Where you're just like, who cares? Who cares? Right? Because church is, has a way of clean, cleansing your mind and, and pushing you back in that right uh, path. Right? The, the ex exhortation of the brethren. Maybe if we don't have things right in our life, it'll fix us. So, if you notice how it's connected, the next step is sinning willfully, not coming to church. That's the. This is the uh, the steps of backsliding. Verse twenty six. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, <clears throat> but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour. The adversaries. Now, verses 26 and 27, uh, people will interpret these in different ways. I believe it's very clear we're speaking about a Christian. Obviously, the, the, the person that I just referred to was a Christian. Is a Christian that's uh, falling into sin. And it would be a Christian that would sin willfully. And notice it says, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, then it says this, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Why does there remain no more sacrifice for sin? What was the whole first half of, of chapter 10 about? He offered a sin once and for all. The lamb went in and you sacrificed repeatedly. But Jesus Christ offered one sacrifice and there's no sacrifice again. Just the one sacrifice. So he explains, hey, if you choose to sin willfully now in the, under the new covenant, he explains, there's no more sacrifice for sin. Now this is paralleled with Hebrews 6. Go to Hebrews 6 quickly. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, if they shall fall away. Does that sound familiar? It's sinning willfully, falling away, backsliding, not going to church. How I was just explaining that. It says, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Now it actually explains, we didn't read all of it there in uh, uh, verse number 5. Oh, no. Did I skip over something there? Oh, verse number 4. It starts, the concept, or the, the thought starts in verse 4. It says, for it, imp is it, it is impossible. I'm sorry. It is impossible. And then he goes through a list of these people doing this, this, and this. He's saying it's impossible to renew them again. So you're not just going to get saved again. You're not going to just go and offer Jesus Christ as a sacrifice again. Why? Because if Jesus was offered again, you'd put him to an open shame. Right. Do you know what you'd do? You'd, you'd lower him to the level of a lamb or of a sheep or of a ram. The blood of bulls and of goats. But the whole point is, uh, like we read in Hebrews 10, he sacrificed one time as opposed to the lambs being sacrificed repeatedly. And then it goes on to explain how if you continue to sin, you're not going to get re-saved, but you're going to receive serious consequences or serious punishments from the Lord 
under the new covenant, you are going to receive a serious uh, 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 punishment. So notice how we see that parallel there. Also it said in verse 26, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Well, Hebrews chapter number 6 says in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. What does it mean to be enlightened? Receive knowledge, right? To be enlightened means that you have learned something. These people have received the knowledge of the truth. It says, There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Why? Because we don't put Jesus to an open shame. It says in verse 27, This is what comes. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment. Judgment is what comes. You're going to be punished. And fiery indignation. Now people think hell. No, it says fiery indignation. It's, 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 it, you're not being punished with fire. His indignation is, is fiery. It's saying strong. That's what it means. Fiery indignation, it says, which shall devour the adversaries. Now, that's, that's uh, you know, uh, he's going to devour them. That doesn't have to mean that he's burning them up. Devour, actually, in the Bible, most of the time, as we saw, the lion devour, saying something is torn apart. Verse 28, it says this, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Verse number 29 proves very clearly that this man is saved. It says that he was, he was sanctified by the blood of this covenant. It was, his heart was sprinkled, is what that's saying. And then it says that he would be doing despite unto the Spirit of grace, saying he received the Spirit of grace, but then he's treating it poorly like he doesn't care. He's grieving the Holy Spirit, right? Well, one thing that I want to point out to you is very interesting. Verse number 28, I've heard a couple of different examples from the Old Testament of who they think that this is referring to when it says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, this is a general statement, and all of those that would receive the death penalty would go about or would be put to death by these particular uh, uh, you know, qualifications. They would die without mercy under two or three witnesses. I want to give you an example, though, of someone who despised the law of God in the Old Testament. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 12, verse number 9. 2 Samuel chapter number 12, verse number 9. This just further proves that Christians, that believers, are the ones that fall into this category of who this is speaking about in context in Hebrews 10. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter number 12, verse number 9 is where we're going to be reading. 2 Samuel chapter number 12, verse number 9. <clears throat> I don't want to read the whole context just because I don't want to waste too much time on just this one example. Um, just look at verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. So this is when Nathan comes to him and he talks about the man that has the lamb, right? Shall surely die. What's the punishment that, he should, that this man should receive? Death. Okay? Look at verse 6. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David didn't think that through. He's going he's to die and then he's going to restore it fourfold. Look at verse number uh, 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. So what does David deserve? Death. Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if, it ha and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Now watch verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. So if we look up examples of people actually despising the law or despising the commandment, do you know what it points us to? David. We actually find an example of David despising the law and it's a law where he himself deserves death and he doesn't deserve mercy. He should die you know, at the hand of two or three witnesses, shouldn't he? That's what David actually deserved under the Old Covenant. So if we want to see an actual example of this, if people try to point to Hebrews 10 to say, hey, look at this guy, this, this isn't talking about someone that's saved. They despise the law of God. You know, Christians don't despise the law of God. Well, David did. You're going to tell me that David wasn't saved? Of course David was a believer. Of course David was a, you know, a, a Christian. He was a saved man. But notice what he did. He despised the law. Why? What is it? Why is it saying despise? Why is it using such strong language? Because he did it willfully. 
Because the context is him sinning willfully. He thought it through. It was premeditated murder and it was premeditated adultery. That's why it's despising. That's why it's such a strong, it's such strong language. And he deserved death in that case. But what it's telling us in this passage in, in uh, uh, verses 28 and 29 about the comparison between the Old uh, Covenant and the New Covenant, it's saying that you, under the New Covenant, you, receive, you deserve an even greater punishment than those under the Old Covenant. Why? Because the blood of the covenant wherewith you are sanctified is better. It's greater. It's a more glorious covenant. Do you know, do you know what that means? There's going to be a stronger punishment to pay. Right? You've broken a more glorious uh, uh, covenant is what you've done. And your, yes, your heart was sprinkled with blood, and, but it wasn't the blood of bulls and of goats. It was blood that, the blood of God. Right. It's the blood with eternal life in it. So it's even, it's even uh, uh, you know, he explains the, how, how it's a more holy thing. Look at verse 29, we'll read that one more time. Of how much sore punishment, sore means like severe or strong. Uh, Suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot Underfoot, I'm sorry, the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite, that's like despising again, despite unto the Spirit of grace. The Bible says, unto whom soever much is given, of him shall much be required. More is given unto us in the New Testament. We have the whole Bible now. We have much greater revelation. It's so much clearer for us. Looking back at the cross, it's so much clearer. Well, what the things that we have. You know, how our salvation was brought to us? We are more accountable than those in the Old Testament. We have a greater covenant in the New Testament. So when we break that covenant, we're going to be more responsible and we're going to you know, uh, uh, be uh, deserving of a greater punishment, a more sore punishment, because we didn't just, you know, uh, uh, trodden underfoot the blood of bulls and of lambs. We trodden underfoot the blood of the Son of God. You know, that's great. That's, you know, that's, that's a, 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 a bad transgression. Look at verse number 30 now. We'll move on. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Notice who he's judging. His people. So who are we talking to? Saved believers. Right? He's, we're talking to saved believers. And that's why he says, For we know him that hath said. It's not like we don't know him. We know him. We're saved. We know him. And we are going to, again, stressing how he's a God of vengeance. And we'll receive a great punishment. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That is a, that is a, a, a much needed verse for a lot of Christians today. A lot of, you know, of the liberal Baptists, all the Baptists that have gone liberal, a lot of these you know, non-denom churches that maybe have the right gospel, they're saved people in them, but they've just apostatized. And they just want to only focus on the positive, right? You have to have the negative. You have to, have, you have to be balanced, right? You know, if, if, if Brother Rick went out there and disconnected, you know, the negative cable off of my battery, it's not going to work. It has to be balanced. Well, the Bible works the same way. If you're going to have a, balance, a good Christian life, it has to be balanced. You have to have the positive and the negative. And the negative actually reinforces the positive. The negative oftentimes is what gets you to do the good things that you should be doing. You know, if you look at, you know, some of the, and not negative as, as far as critiquing, but, you know, uh, in the sense of not being, uh, uh, you know, uh, happiness and things along those lines, right? Uh, negative in the sense of anger, right? Where people wouldn't like it. Uh, if you look at some of the things about God's personality, obviously he has the positive. You know, he's, he's merciful, but he's also a just God and God, he's a God of punishment. That, people would think, hey, that's negative, right? It's not good for us at least, right? You have to have that because you know what it does when fear is in your heart? It actually drives you to do what's right, right. and to do what's good. You know why Paul's telling you this right now? He's trying to remind you that, hey, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, that's a good verse to memorize, just to think about. It is. It's a scary thing when you, when you try to comprehend just God Himself. You know, He says in the Old Testament, it says, Thus saith the High and Lofty One, I am He that inhabiteth eternity. Stop and think about that for a minute. You know, you have this, you have this being out there, this supernatural being that is omnipotent, He's omniscient, He has all power, He's all-knowing, He's omnipresent, and He dwells in eternity. He says, I am He that inhabiteth eternity eternity. Amen. And he's a spirit. You should try to wrap your mind around. He tries to explain to us, my thoughts are not like your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. 
He's not like us. He is a great and a mighty and a terrible God, and he's someone that we should greatly fear. When you stop and you think about him like, hey, he's outside of time. Things don't happen from beginning to end. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You know, he is the beginning and the end. You know, we, we, you, you stop and you try to think about how creation was brought about, how he spoke this entire world into existence. He spoke this world into existence. You know where that power came from? His inner soul, his being, his nature. He spoke the worlds. He, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, he spoke the word and he literally, you know, created time, space, and matter. He created beings that can think and can operate and, you know, and, and can make decisions. He created souls, living, conscious souls. Right. You know, he is a fearful being. When you think about all the power and the strength and, 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 the, and the intelligence that he has, and now he's just a different being than us. He's a spirit. He's just eternally existed and he will eternally exist. That should scare you, buddy. When you stop and you dwell upon the, the greatness and the, just the supernatural aspect of God, it's a fearful thing. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Not only that, we have God's personality revealed to us. And He is a just God. He is a God of mercy. And He is a God of grace. But He is also a God of justice. And He is a God of vengeance. He is a God of wrath. You know, uh, 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 my helper, my new helper, has been reading through the Bible. Uh, and uh, he, he made, he's made it through the book of Deuteronomy, my helper at my secular job. He made it to the book of Deuteronomy. And one morning, he always comes in. He knows I'm a pastor, and I love to talk to him about the Bible while we're working. And as, and as soon as he came in, his first words to me after he got through half of the book of Deuteronomy, you know, in the King James Bible, of course, he said to me, he said, Man, God is a wrathful God. You know, but he also understood because he actually read the Bible. A lot of people that say those things don't ever read it. He said he is extremely merciful and long-suffering and patient. He put up with the Israelites for a long time. He, he understood. But you know what he also knew? God is a wrathful God. That wrath comes from his justice. He has to be wrathful against wickedness. And, and, and you know, when, when people are you know, impenitent, they will not repent. There comes a time where, hit, where hit that line is of, of true justice. He has to become wrathful. He, he's long-suffering. He puts up with it as long as he can, but he will, not, he will not defy his justice. We need to remember that. It's a fearful thing. It's a fear, the Bible calls God terrible. Do you know what that means? He's terrible. He instills, he instills terror into you. Right. He's able to make you, uh, you know, to be terrified. That's what that means. He's terrible. He's not bad. He's terrible, meaning he brings about, he's able to bring about terror. He should bring about terror. You're not supposed to fear man. You should rather fear him that's able to you know, destroy both you know, a soul and body in hell. You know, God is fearful. We should fear God. It's good to have a, a good, healthy fear of God. Amen. We should fear God. He's worthy of our fear. Yeah, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Notice present tense, it is. Same God of the Old Testament. There's not two gods. It's not the, you didn't have these two personalities, right? It's just one God. And the God of the Old Testament, all of those same qualities and personalities, the same God of the New Testament. Right. Same God of the New Testament. Actually, that quote that I said, you know, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, in the book of Isaiah, you find God saying that over and over again. I am the Lord, the first and the last. You know, you know, and beside me, there is no Savior. It's the same God. All the same qualities, all the same. He says He changes not. I am the Lord, I change not. So it's not like we get to the New Testament, all of a sudden God just like shifts and changes. Like he's just all, you know, people like envision just Jesus with long hair, you know, walking around just like in a, you know, in a gown, just giving up peace signs and, you know, and, and just uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rainbows everywhere. Nothing changed. You need to read the book of Revelation to figure out how Jesus is. There's, all, there's more wrath in the book of Revelation than there is anywhere in the Bible. You know, it's the same God from the Old and New Testament. He's loving. He's merciful. But He's also uh, wrathful in vengeance. You know, He has vengeance. And we need to fear that. We need to not want to be on the, the receiving end of His wrath. And we should fear the Lord and, be a, and have a healthy fear of Him. Look at verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days. Watch this. In which after ye were illuminated. Now, do you remember that also in Hebrews 6? You were enlightened. 
Notice that, illuminated, right? Ye endured a great fight of affliction. So he's saying, notice, call to remembrance the time when after you, you, know, you were illuminated, you were saved, you received the gospel. Ye endured a great fight of affliction. So what's he telling them to do right now? You need to endure again. Call to mind when you were enduring, when you had patience. Remember, that's the theme here. <clears throat> Partly, whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. Now, what's a gazing stock? A gazing stock, to gaze at something means to look, right? A stock is just, you know, referring to, you know, the, just the, uh, uh, something that you're looking at, the substance of it. A gazing stock, right? You're just a thing, basically. That's how it's being used in a general way. So it's something you're just looking at and staring at. It's saying people were looking at you all the time. It's talking about them being mocked and ridiculed and persecuted. It says, both by reproaches and afflictions. So reproaches is something verbal a lot of times. Afflictions is something physical. And partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. So also some of it is because you became companions. I want you to notice this. You became friends with or companions with those that had endured reproaches and afflictions. Now he's going to tell you who he's talking about. Verse 34. For because you had compassion of me and my bonds. So he, the person that they came, became companions with that were so used or treated in such a way is the writer. It's the author. And he says, for you had compassion of me and my bonds. Now the author I personally believe is Paul. I'm not going to go over all of the different reasons why I believe that. He mentions Timothy. I'm, I'll, I'll just give you three of them that are really top ones. He mentions Timothy and, uh, in the last chapter. He mentions that he is in, in Italy uh, when he wrote this epistle. And uh, you know, obviously Paul's the only person that ever sent out Timothy. It was his protege. Uh, he was in Italy because he was in bonds in Italy. Right here we see him mentioning that he is in bonds. Um, and then there's a lot of things about his literary style. This book ends with the same exact closer that every other book that only Paul wrote. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This one actually ends with grace be with you all. Amen. Just a shortened version of that or a contracted version of that. The only place that that's found is actually at the end of the book of Titus. And we know that Paul authored the book of Titus. So Hebrews, uh, 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 the, the very last verse is the same as the very last verse in the book of Titus. But uh, I have one other reason why I'm going to tell you that uh, in this chapter, actually, why I believe that Paul also was the author. Another one, uh, and I had a few of them that I brought up in Hebrews, or in the introduction to the book of Hebrews, that I, I can't recall at this moment, and I don't want to spend time on that. But he says, um, For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and he was in prison, right? And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now that's a testimony. You took joyfully. You allowed people to come and take your things. People are coming and, 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 and spoiling their goods. I want you to think about that. And they were joyful about it. You know, it's like when Jesus told them, if you, know, if, if, if you suffer persecution for the Son of Man's sake, you should leap for joy. This also took place, the apostles you know, actually put that into practice because in the book of Acts, I believe Acts 4, it says after they were beaten, it says that they went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to, su to suffer shame for His name. So notice that. We can see the apostles doing it, Jesus commanding it, us to do it. We see the good example of those that Paul's writing to. And it says, And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. I wish you know, all Christians would have that great faith. I wish I could continue to have that great faith all the time. Just keeping my eyes in heaven and my affections in heaven. You know, uh, um, it's easy to get wrapped up in the things of this world, but it's all going to burn up one day. It's all going to be gone one day. And we should uh, know in heaven we have a better and an enduring substance Amen. in heaven. Something better and something that's going to last. Where moth and rust does, does not or doth not corrupt. And it's better. Notice that theme again. It's better. Uh, verse number 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence. Notice again, confidence, assurance, the same theme. Which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, the enduring, the patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Now notice that if they've already done the will of God. Because how many, how many conditions are there for salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. They said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Just one thing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Notice that they had done the will of of God. Turn to John 6 quickly and we'll look at an example of this. What is the will of God? People will ask that sometimes. What is the will of God? Let's see if I can remember the exact verse. It's 40 something. If somebody remembers they could maybe... Yeah, 38. There it is. 
uh, verse 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. What's the will of God? What do you have to do? Believe on Him. So notice he says that you need patience after that you have done the will of God. So what had the people he's writing to done? Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saved and he says you need to have patience now. So that you can receive a reward. Notice all of this is about a reward. Remember Hebrews chapter 6. You know, uh, we need, you need to add to your faith patience. He, he, he uh, provokes them over and over again. That you be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience... Who through faith and patience, right? Like Abraham did. We need to have faith. Of course, we're, we're saved. We, we uh, have our faith we, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we need to add to it patience afterwards. So he says, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now I want you to notice, I'm going to point out, I'm going to explain verse, uh, a couple of interpretations of verse 38 and 39. These are also uh, uh, debated or controversial verses on what it actually means and what people think it, how to interpret it. Um, one thing, another proof that I believe Paul authored the, the book of Hebrews, a lot of the quotes from the Old Testament, um, Paul quotes them repeatedly. And I, I showed that as an example. And um, uh, uh, with other quotations, this is also another one. Verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. That's actually quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 and it's quoted three times in the New Testament. Romans 1.17, Paul authored Romans. Uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3 verse 11 and then here in Hebrews 10.38. So Paul's the only person who actually quotes uh, this verse. And it's from the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. I believe that that's also uh, just another of the many uh, reasons why I believe Paul authored uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, another thing I want to point out, verse 38, but if any man draw back, he says this, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Why does he say that? Well, because Hebrews 11:6 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. So please, pleasure. He's saying without faith, he's not, you're not going to be able to please him. If you draw back, if you don't have faith, he's saying, the just shall live by faith. He says, you know, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, I have a uh, uh, there's really three, but I'm going to give you two. The third one is kind of a stretch, but two possible interpretations of verses 38 and 39. A lot of people will use this to say that you can lose your, your salvation, and um, you know I don't believe that that's obviously you know I don't believe that that's what this is teaching. I believe that the Bible is very clear about eternal security. You know we cannot lose our salvation. It's extremely clear. You know He paid it all to Him I owe, and we're eternally secure. It says in verse. Uh, 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, we don't draw back to perdition. This is one interpretation you could use. We don't draw back uh, to perdition as in destruction. Just like the punishment maybe that he mentioned. You could maybe try to interpret it that way. Uh, we don't draw back unto perdition where we're not pleasing God and we just fall into a... a, a think of drawing back and you could use it this way. Now I don't personally believe that this is the correct interpretation but it's possible I'm not settled on either one. I, 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 you know, I'm not sure what I believe about this yet. But drawing back is similar to backsliding. So maybe this person is just drawing back and they're backslidden, right? And they're drawing back into perdition, maybe the destruction that he just spoke of, the punishment that he just spoke of, right? Uh, but he says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Right? So maybe, uh, you know, soul sometimes isn't just referring to, you know, the, 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 the spiritual soul that we have, that which is of, of the nature of a spirit that's inside of us. But sometimes soul is just like the person, right? Uh, like uh, referring to, you know, the Bible talks about uh, when uh, Joseph and Israel and, all, and Jacob, all of them, went down into Egypt. It talks about how 70 souls went, right? So it's just the people. There's a verse, Brother Rick found a good verse one time. I can't remember what it was about how, you know, something about the soul touching something 
in the Old Testament. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it talks about a soul touching something. Obviously, that's not the spirit. That's the man himself. And what is it specifically? The, the flesh, right? So there you can see that it's clearly not being used as your spirit, right? The, your spiritual soul. So maybe that's what it's talking about. The saving of the soul is in like the person, right? Uh, not, and not saving of from heaven to hell, but again, save, being saved from destruction. That's used very often like that. You know, people may think, well, that's a stretch. No, I can show you very clear examples where everyone would agree, yeah, that's not, you know, G Peter said, Lord, save me, when he's sinking in the water. He's not asking him to save him from hell. He's talking about a physical salvation there. Most of the time in the Old Testament when the word is, when the word saved is used, it's talking about a physical salvation. So possibly this is referring to a physical salvation. Perdition there is just, it, perdition just means destruction, right? So maybe it's a physical destruction. This is possible and the drawing back is, a, is a, a, you know, someone backsliding. I personally don't think that that's that is it because perdition, yes it means destruction, but oftentimes the destruction that it's referring to is hell. So, you know, that kind of pushes me away. I could be wrong. And then also, but to them that believe to the saving of the soul, you know, I don't personally interpret this as the person. It's very possible though, and I'm not like super sold on either of these interpretations. Um, what I more so believe is this interpretation though, and I'll tell you why that one to me has a little bit uh, well, if you interpret it as physical salvation, then you have no problem. But one thing that will pose a problem um, with verse 39 is if you try to use this just as a verse of encouragement. I've heard people try to explain that that way when he says, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them, who, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, how, does Paul, how would Paul know that? Do you think every single person there... Didn't you think? Do you think it's possible that you know uh, all of the Hebrews didn't backslide? And also, this is written to all Christians. There's a lot of Christians that backslide that do draw back into perdition, right? So I think that kind of creates a problem. That it would just be words of encouragement, but it's it has to be true. This is you know the Holy Spirit. My personal interpretation of it is that. <clears throat> He says this, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So there's a type of drawing back, right? This is obviously a Christian here. There is a type of drawing back, and that is a backslide. But then he says this, But we are not of them who draw back, watch this, unto perdition. So notice how there's a possibility that you could draw back, but then he makes a very clear definitive statement, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. That's interesting, and that I feel is very, very obvious. Saying, so you could draw back, but then he reassures you, we are not of them that draw back unto perdition. So you could be punished, you could backslide, he just got done talking about a possible destruction that you could receive, but then he uses the word perdition, which is very often, almost exclusively in the Bible, talking about destruction of the soul and going to hell, specifically the soul. It's a word that speaks to like spiritual, you know, salvation. He's saying that, yeah, you, if you did draw back, you know, you wouldn't lose your salvation, then he's, but then he says this, we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul, saying we are those that are saved. We're, you know, we're not going to, you know, draw back in, in, the, in the sense of just like, you know, uh, uh, reject salvation. That's what he's saying, I believe. There's a different type of, you know, you could, you know, a person could, you know, uh, get, now this is possible. I can see how somebody could try to tie this in with the other interpretation of Hebrews 6. But a person could, with the word draw back here, get close to salvation and then draw back. Because that never says that this person actually got into salvation in that sense. And there, I would definitely say there are two different types of drawing back that are, that are paralleled here. One that's under perdition and one that is not under perdition. Now the strong proof of that is this. Just, just think of it. I, is, is every verse of the Bible true and every statement of the Bible true? Amen, right? Every, every verse and every statement then that means that everyone that Paul wrote to and he himself are not of them that draw back into perdition. They cannot draw back into perdition if every word of the Bible is true, which we all believe that, right? So that clearly is saying that you cannot draw back into perdition. But then in verse number 37, or 38, I'm sorry, he talks about if any man draw back. So to me, it sounds like he's talking about two different types of drawing back, right? A person that maybe draws back into apostasy. But then a person that draws back unto perdition where that person maybe, like think of maybe a Jew in, in, in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. Jesus comes. They're not saved. They didn't understand it. They were getting confused by, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
And, you know, which is a different religion, of course. You know, Paul talks about how he was, you know, uh, in the religion of the Jews, you know, and then contrast that with Christianity. So he, you know, that person is confused by that. Then they receive the gospel for the first time. They're, they're, you know, they have this vestige of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament God. They receive the gospel. They have the possibility of, of continuing there and, 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 and uh, you know, getting saved. But then they draw back. They decide that they don't want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That could be two different types of drawing back. That's what I believe even more so. And it says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And you could say that that's present tense. And then the third interpretation, I'm running out of time, I'm just going to give it to you really super quick. The third interpretation is in the sense of faith, you could never draw back. I think that that's hard by verse number 37 to, to say that because if any man draw back, it's, it almost seems like why would he even say it if there is a possibility. This is kind of deep, I realize that, but why, is there even, why would he even say it's a, 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 a possibility if you couldn't draw back? Now I personally, and I realize that this is very... Uh, um, you know, uh, a heated debate right now amongst a lot of people about like whether you could stop believing or not. I personally do not believe that you can stop believing. I believe once you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't believe that you'll ever become a Muslim or become, you know, uh, in Judaism or, you know, uh, uh, just completely forsake Christianity and, you know, hate the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the, you know, we have the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. His witness bears witness with our, you know, or His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. You know, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is there to guide us into all truth. You know, uh, if a person could just be steeped in and just forsake, you know, uh, Christianity entirely, then the, the period of tribulation with the mark of the beast makes no sense. It would make no sense. Uh, because then you'd have a bunch of people just taking the mark of the beast. What would be the difference between that and then now? Right? Um, you know, the Bible's real clear. Jesus in John 10, this is super, super strong. Jesus in John 10 says, you know, a stranger will they not follow. They will not follow the voice of a stranger. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. When Jesus showed up, those that were saved knew his voice and followed him, according to Jesus. And it said, all that came before me were robbers, they were thieves, and they, they knew not the voice of a stranger. I mean, that's clear. That's saying they will not follow the voice of a stranger. So you could also interpret this, if you wanted to, as saying that we are them that believe to the saving of the soul, uh, saying to the end, again, referring to the body, that we would believe to the end. Uh, so that was a little extensive there at the end. I just want to give you some examples and way to interpret those so that maybe you don't become discouraged about not understanding it and feel like it's a contradiction. But there are three, I believe, pretty feasible options uh, of what that could be referring to uh, when it's speaking about uh, you know, drawing back. Right? The Bible is real clear uh, that salvation is eternal. It's eternal security. We take the really clear verses, the teaching of you know, uh, the entirety of the Bible, and we understand the Bible in light of those. And we have a couple of verses that are kind of confusing. Well, we just study them out. Study to show thyself approved unto God. There's hard things to be understood in Paul's writings. Peter said that people would twist things in Paul's writings that are hard to be understood. So uh, that would make perfect sense. The book of Hebrews is probably the most complicated book in the New Testament. That's one of the harder books in the New Testament. And Paul, you know, uh, uh, people will try to twist this, you know, uh, Pentecostals and things, to teach that you could lose your salvation. Uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word, dear Lord. Uh, there's so much to preach on, dear God. Uh, we ask you that, uh, that uh, that was a lot, so we ask you that everybody would, uh, enjoyed it, dear Lord, and that, uh, that it sunk down into our ears, that we would meditate upon your word. Uh, help us not to stray away from the deep things. Help us to just love all of it, even though it takes a lot of time to study and, and, and to read through, dear God. Just guide us with your spirit. Help us to not become discouraged, uh, but help us to, to, to be enlightened, to have uh, an understanding of your word. Thank you for everyone that showed up tonight and for the great encouragement of the visitor coming again. Uh, we love you so much. Help us to have great unity within the church. Help us to be a church that's just pleasing to you and just guide us and direct us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.